So remember, and I, I don't give you all the information, but a minimal in some domain. Uh, there is always this quantity, which is important. OK. And uh, when you're minimal, this quantity is constant as a function of r. OK. Uh, and if this quantity uh, is constant on some interval, I always include 0 because I know that the quantity has a limit, OK, by uh, monotonicity. Uh, then E coincides with a minimal cone in, let's say, the corresponding ball. OK, and it, it's very good to know. And now, now come my two little consequences of compactness that I wanted to say. So now if, so uh, I will call that almost constant density. Uh, and I will uh, scale things out so that, uh, so that the statement is just a little bit simpler. And then freely, I will uh, rescale in the other direction if needed. So let's say if E is almost minimal uh, in the ball, uh, let's have center 0 and radius 2. And there is this gauge function, h of 2. So the thing that measures how almost minimal it is uh, and I suppose that it's less than epsilon. So uh, things are very close to being minimal. And uh, theta, uh, oh, and there is this Dini condition that I have to put. Uh, this is essentially to know that uh, theta has a limit at 0. So uh, let's say Dini on h. Okay, and finally, the main condition, which is that, let's say, uh, theta uh, density uh, at x, but in fact, I take the limit at 0, is less than theta of x r. Uh, well, sorry. That's not what I mean. So this is the main assumption. Uh, and I'm trying to be clever, but you, you should not. Let's think that E is uh, minimal. This, in this case, the density is non-decreasing. In this case, this thing takes a simpler formula, which is the one that I almost wrote, which is that the density at 0 is less than the density at r, less than the density at r0. And I suppose that this last one is very close to the density at 0. So that's what I mean by almost constant density. OK. With all these natural informations, uh, I claim I get uh, that uh, there exists a minimal cone x such that E is delta close to x in, say, half the ball. And delta close means every point of E is within uh, delta of x, and every point of x is within delta of E. And the quantifiers are, as you guessed, if you want very close here, you have to ask uh, much more constant density than that. Okay. So uh, two words about the proof, but I don't write it down. Uh, A proof is a standard proof by compactness. Suppose this is false, then it means that for each 
so I give myself a delta. For each epsilon, it doesn't work. Uh, so let's say epsilon is equal to 2 to the minus n. Uh, then for each one, you find a counterexample, a minimal set, which you call En. Okay? Then you extract a subsequence with, for which the minimal set converges to some guy. Okay? And then you look at this guy and you try to find out what you know about it. Uh, because of this assumption here, and because epsilon tends to zero, and because we have a theorem about limits, the limiting set is minimal. Okay. Uh, this was essentially to state that. So this is the reason why you don't see it in the argument. Uh, because of this, and because we also have semi-continuity on, uh, on the Hausdorff measure, and also because we're in the case of a locally minimizing sequence, if you want. Or, I mean, there is something that I didn't say, which is the, and I even was asked, there is also an upper semi-continuity result for Hausdorff measure. So anyway, you get that the densities converge to the density of a limit. And this says that the density of a limit is constant. So the limit is a minimal cone. And if a limit is a minimal cone, after some time, you get that it's epsilon close to the other guy because uh, this was the definition of a limit. Okay, so it's, it's the sort of arguments, as soon as you have a good theorem about limits, you play this game, game all the time. Uh, okay, so again, this is more or less the same as this, but this is the one we're going to use. Okay, and there is a second thing that I, uh, uh, that I want to use also. Again, it's a similar sort of statement. Suppose uh, E, F are both almost minimal, uh, let's say, in the double of a unit ball. Okay. Suppose, uh, suppose the and are epsilon close to each other. In that ball, suppose again that uh, Dini. Uh, I think in this case I don't need it, but uh, since I don't remember for sure, let me just put it. And h of two is less than epsilon, so both are with the same h. Okay. Then, uh, if you look at Hausdorff measure of e intersected with any ball, you compare it with the same thing for f. You make a small error. And each time I div divide the radius by two because fuzzy things could happen at the boundary. Okay. Again, proof by compactness. Uh, suppose this is not true. Uh, you go to the limit. You can go to the limit in the Hausdorff measures, uh, as I hit hinted. Uh, if you started with guys that were more and more close to each other uh, at the limit, uh, they coincide. In other words, they have the same limit. Uh, Hausdorff measure goes to the limit. Yet, you would find this ball where the two things are different, contradiction. Okay, not, not so surprising. There is just a little thing that I have to say. Uh, here, if you want the Hausdorff measure to really go to the limit, in principle, the theorems that we get is that we only get a lower semi-continuity result for open sets, inside open sets, like in these balls. Uh, the upper semi-continuity would mean closed sets, like the boundary of a ball. So hidden in this lemma, there is the fact that actually the intersection with a sphere of a minimal set has measure zero. Okay, and then I can say this. And if I did not want to use this, uh, I would have to say for almost every radius, and it would not change things so much. But okay, okay, no, no nothing too surprising. Uh, okay, when you control, essentially it means that when you control the almost minimizers in some way, uh, you usually control them in the other ways that you like. Good, no question about this. 
Then I have a short uh, section on blow up limits. Which means you start from E and almost minimal set in some domain with some gauge function. You pick x0, let's say, uh, in the set E. When you put it outside, the blow up limits are not interesting, they're empty. Okay. Uh, you give yourself a sequence that tends to 0 of radii. Okay. You define EK is equal to E minus x0, so that puts it back to the origin, divide by RK uh, that blows it up because RK tends to 0. Okay. And you notice that this is uh, almost minimal in the open set UK is equal to same formula 1 over RK uh, E minus x0. If x0 is in the interior of U, these domains increase and they eventually contain everything with a gauge function which you can also compute. And this gauge function also tends to zero because you're looking at smaller and smaller balls. Okay? So this is very easy to compute. Uh, and it's better if you just believe me. Uh, okay? You can always find subsequences tends to infinity locally in Hausdorff measure. And in this case, it happens in the whole, uh, whole Rn, because the domains tend to infinity. OK, not surprising. And this is called the blower limit. And there are some, they are not necessarily all the same, etc. Okay. Uh, and what can I say about those blow up limits? And again, I'm reviewing, and the story is exactly the same thing as for Camilo. Uh, we have theorems about limits, so everything has to happen nicely. Uh, so a number of things happen. So first thing is that E infinity is minimal. This is because of a limiting theorem plus the fact that those functions tend to zero. Again, it's really uh, uh, everything here is happening on the whole domain and not just a small uh, domain. If you look at, let's say, theta e infinity, so the density, let's say, at a point zero and radius r, you look at what it is. Uh, there is this theorem about limits that says that uh, Hausdorff measures tend to uh, tend to the right thing uh, here, and uh, in fact here I can say that it's the limit for each radius uh, k tends to infinity of theta k, and I uh, I suppose you know what I mean of zero r is the same thing as the limit. R tends to infinity, uh, sorry, K tends to infinity. Uh, when you compute this guy, you do the change of variable by blow up. Thetas are supposed to stay the same because they were normalized correctly. And you're left with theta E of X zero uh, R R K. And when you look at this limit, this is exactly what we call theta of X zero, zero. Okay, because those guys tend to zero. Okay. No surprise. So constant density, OK? Uh, this is a constant. Uh, the const uh, not only that, but the constant density is exactly the density at the point that we started with. Uh, and in particular, this means that E infinity is a cone. Okay. So blow up limits are minimal cones. Uh, we're supposed to be happy for some reasons, but the main one is that you expect minimal cones to be much easier to understand than minimal sets of the same dimension. Uh, in fact, when you want to study a minimal cone, you want to look at its, in, at its intersection with a sphere. Okay? You get one set with one less dimension. So the bad story is that it's not really minimal. It satisfies some minimizing property that comes from the fact that it was a minimizing cone. Uh, for instance, you would know that it's 
if it was smooth, you would know that its uh, uh, mean curvature is zero on the sphere. Okay. Uh, but, okay, it has some minimizing properties, but not all of them. Okay, so it's not as easy to continue with the induction as you would like. Uh, but, okay. So, for instance, if you start with two dimensional minimal sets, you get two dimensional minimal cones. The intersection with a sphere is one dimensional, satisfies some minimality properties. And it's not so hard to show that in this case, the intersection is composed, maybe I'll write it down, is composed of arcs of great circles, I mean geodesics, right, on the sphere. And this is already an important information. Okay, let me call systematically X minimal cones. Uh, let's uh, call K X intersected with DB of 0, 1. And what I claim you can do essentially by hand is K is a finite union of arcs of geodesics. So geodesics are just great circles, which means circles that come from planes that contain the origin. Okay. And this is, a, I mean, it's not enough. We still have to know which finite unions are minimal cones. It's not always that easy, but at least you get some information. Okay, you're back to a one-dimensional problem, and in principle, you're happy for some time. And since I started talking about dimension two, uh, so when n is equal to three, again, uh, d is equal to two, uh, then, in fact, the list of minimal cones is known. Okay, let's say x is equal to p, y, or t. So this is planes. Uh, this is unions of three half planes that. Uh, come together and make an angle uh, equal to uh, 120 degrees. Sorry for the bad picture. <laughs> it's, it's much worse. So just believe what I say. Uh, three half planes that make uh, 120 degree angles with each other along a line. Okay. And T is going to be even more pathetic the way I'm going to draw this. Uh, so this is the cone over the union of edges of a regular tetrahedron. Okay, it has a spine composed of four legs that make equal angle to each other. And then uh, here there is a face. Uh, here there is another face. There will be a third face uh, that I don't want to draw with a uh, third leg below, and there is three more faces uh, that I don't draw here below. Okay? One, two, three. Okay. Uh, I'll show pictures later, but I don't want to, to do it now. And I hope you know what it is. But, uh, okay. So again, six faces, four edges, and uh, okay. okay. If you know what, yeah, uh, you imagine the tetrahedron, you imagine the center, and then you have to think about the edges and things like that. Okay? That's, okay. That's uh, what's happening in dimension uh, three. And when uh, uh, larger than four, uh, these ones still exist. You take the product, I mean, you just take one of those in R4 and it's still minimal. Uh, we know one or two more. In fact, we know two more, as far as I know. We know one which is a, actually a whole collection. Uh, 
It's been proved a few years ago that right? if you take two planes that are almost orthogonal in R4, it's possible. Uh, so they don't meet in particular except at zero. Uh, then it's minimal if the angle is sufficiently close to pi over two. So that's something by uh, Xiang Yu. And another thing actually by her two. If you take two one-dimensional y's, okay, take the product again in R4, it's again minimal. Okay. There might be lots of other ones, and uh, we don't know. At some point in time, I had a dream of having a computer give me the list. Uh, but then apparently it's because I don't know anything about computers that I had this dream. Okay, it's apparently it's not so easy. Okay, and when in larger dimensions, I have no idea. Okay, so that's one of the little defects. Okay, theorem. Uh, don't remember the date about seventy, I think. Uh, check that I don't forget anything here. Okay. Yes. For the small ones, yes. So, for instance, one thing, but at the same time, there are stupid things that we can't prove. We believe they are true, but we can't prove them. Uh, which would sort of contradict uh, what happens. I mean, it's in this game, uh, you know, uh, when you don't know what to prove, actually this is the way you start stating theorems that don't go too far. You try to list minimal cones by density. So one thing we're completely sure of is that the lowest possible density is planes. Uh, this is because we have this density result for rectifiable sets. Those guys are rectifiable. So almost everywhere the density has to be larger than, in this case, it's pi. Okay, um, uh, which I will still call omega two. So planes are the best. E up to dimension eight, I think, or seven, there is this Simon thing that says that if you try, so if you try something on the sphere, which is smooth, okay, up to dimension seven, you know that you will not get a minimal cone, which means, uh, okay, which means that up to this dimension and afterwards, I don't know. Uh, it's possible that afterwards you can uh, prove. The, you have to have a singularity and the lowest possible singularity in this case that you could probably prove by induction. So I'm, I'm saying this for sure for uh, low dimensions, but I, I think this part is true, is a Y. Three things that... So the next density is 3 half times pi. And I think this is true in, you know, in many dimensions already. Okay. And then this is the time when I don't know exactly, because it could be uh, we don't know a Simon theorem uh, based on Ys. So if you have something on the sphere which looks like a Y, intersection of a Y, which means three half circles making the right angles, but a smooth version of that, uh, we don't have a theorem of Simon that says that this thing here is not stable. Okay? As a consequence, there might be very flat versions of the Y that could be minimal, okay? would have densities that are as close to three halves as possible. So we know that if, if the density is three halves, it has to be a Y. It cannot be a small perturbation. This is part of a gene theory of theorem in some sense. Okay? But again, I mean, there might be already at this point, there might be candidates for being uh, minimal cones that are you know, just a little bit above. Okay? And then it's not completely clear whether, I mean, if those guys exist, you know, maybe there will be multiple densities. So there is one case, of course, where you know that what you were saying is not exactly true, but at the same time, it's cheating. If you take two almost orthogonal planes, they always have the same density, but they are not exactly the same. At the same time, I mean, it's clear it's part of the same family, so it doesn't count. Okay. And then we come into this problem, but anyway, I don't have any cone to propose to you, so the conjecture is still true up to what we know, because we don't have a counterexample. 
hard to imagine. So I was ready to believe that, so if I had a conjecture to make, I would say that if you're in high enough dimension, it's probably not so hard to find lots of finite unions of zero dz and so on and so forth. And maybe we'll be able to find a one parameter of family of guys that can turn, have the same density, and so on. Okay? And which would not be the planes, because the planes is a little too easy. They're essentially far away from each other. So it's not changing angles or something like this. It's, uh, okay. But I say this, but for instance, Yang Yu says exactly the opposite, saying too much rigidity, you're never going to be able to do that. Okay. <laughs> and neither of us can prove the other wrong because we don't have examples. Okay. Right, uh, Jean Teraf here, uh, no more questions? Okay. Wow, I managed to be late all the time. Okay, uh, at least you deserve a statement. So let E, let's say, uh, be an almost minimal set, and let me not take risk, let's say, in, okay, well, in U. Uh, take even less risk like this. Uh, I ask, Uh, for some positive alpha, R to the alpha, but again, uh, a strong Dini condition would be enough, but then you would not get exactly C1 plus epsilon. Okay. Let X lie in E, which is inside uh, E. Then there is a neighborhood. Uh, let, oh, sorry, and I forgot to say the dimension is two, and in Gene Taylor's theorems, the ambient dimension is three, so that we know the list of minimal cones. Let x be a blow up limit of e at x. Okay. So it's either a plane, a cone, or something like this. And you know which type, because you, if you know the density at that point, you know it has to be a plane, a y, or a t, depending on density. In this case, things are simple. Then there is a, an, a small ball. case Rn is R3. Uh, and let's say phi of 0 is equal to, this is just to make sure that we're not saying something completely stupid. Maybe we don't need this information, but okay. okay. So again, this is the best thing that I can say, yeah, uh, this is the best thing that I can say once I know I have a singularity of type x. The best thing I can say is that the thing is a C1 plus epsilon version of that set X. Okay? Uh, when X is a plane, as soon as you know C1 plus epsilon, uh, you may know more. In particular, if the set was minimal, you know that it's smooth, C infinity, analytic. Uh, I don't know for sure because I forgot to check what happens near the Y, but anyway, you would have three analytic guys coming like this, making a 120 degree angle. And it's probably a hint that everything is analytic nearby because the intersection of these analytic functions is an analytic curve and so on. Okay, so, and if it's only smooth, I don't know, but this, this is in principle easier to check. Once you get this, you can work again. Okay. Uh, yeah, you were about to ask a question, but not anymore. Okay, good. I should, yeah, should always continue speaking just in case. Okay, so that's the statement. Uh, two words about possible improvements. E, uh, this is good because, uh, you know, I say x, but I know which sort of x uh, is happening. It's either a plane, a y, or a t, so it, it's not so bad. In higher dimensions, there is a theorem like this too, uh, with two little drawbacks. First, you don't know the list of x's. So the statement also says there is a minimal cone, which is its blow-up limit, but uh, you know, it might be some of a type that you don't know about. And the second is that since we don't know which minimal cones, some geometric information is harder to get. And for some of them, we might not get C1 plus epsilon. We're only able to get Hölder. 
equivalent. We have an holder exponent as close to 1 as we want. But it's a little sad that it's not C1 plus epsilon. And C1 plus epsilon would follow if I think if we had more information. And OK, it's a geometric thing about the cone. And it's harder to prove when you don't know exactly the cone. <coughs> okay. Um, OK, it's a little sad that it's limited to two-dimensional guys. Uh, we'd be very happy if uh, there was improvement for higher dimensions. There is one thing which is known, it's uh, I think due to Algren again, uh, which is when the thing looks a lot when the blow-up limit is a plane and you're, uh, and you're close enough to a plane, then in half a ball the thing is a smooth version of a plane. Okay? Uh, it's not it does not follow from Allard's theorem because here I have assumptions of almost minimality and not stronger assumptions. But apparently, uh, it's true, too. Okay. Uh, and the last comment was that I, uh, you know, uh, I had still intend to show you pictures for two minutes and a half. And then you'll see that this theorem is very easy to see in nature. Uh, whenever you pull out soap on something, you see Jean Taylor's theorem right away. Okay. And of course, I, I mean, yeah. If you were students, I would, could defy you to find other types of singularities in soap films. But uh, I know you'll n not even try because uh, you believe in math. OK. Elements of proof. And again, uh, yeah, it's not, in this case, uh, this is just going to be sketchy, uh, especially because the full theorem is long to prove some technical details. If you see some of the things that look like Allard's theorem, uh, as explained by, uh, by <laughs> Camilo yesterday, uh, it's not a surprise. There is differences, but you, you always like to do the same sort of things. And at the end, for instance, the central part is going to say, again, that harmonic functions are smooth. So we still want to compare at some point of time with harmonic graphs. Okay. So before uh, I save it, so uh, OK. If you wanted a C1 plus epsilon result, you have to get some geometric information or another. The simplest is to use these numbers that measure flatness. OK. Oh, maybe, let's say, uh, the initial x is equal to 0, and then I can use the letter x for some other point nearby. OK, so I, everything is centered at 0. Uh, if we prove that this is less than c times r to, let's say, the power alpha or epsilon or something like this, uh, then it's going to be enough to prove c1 regularity. So if I, get, if I prove that the guys are flatter and flatter, it's really a matter of, you know, uh, this tells you that the differences between two approximating planes will be of the order of r to the alpha between r and r over 2. Then you show that the direction of a plane converges when r tends to 0. Uh, then you show that it's holder continuous, and at the end you get the result. Okay, so I'm saying this, but uh, in this holder version, which would use a theorem of Reifenberg on parameterization, which is not so bad anyway, uh, we'll try this. But uh, it's important if we want to really get information that. This number here is as small as you want and is uniform on x and r. You know, it's not enough to just say for each x, when r tends to 0, the thing gets flat. Uh, that would be cheating. I really want a uniform norm. And this is what we can prove more easily. So I, I'll do this because it's an exercise on, uh, uh, on the two statements that I had up there. And then we'll try to talk about c1, and it's going to be a more complicated story. Hmm. We'll try. <coughs> OK, so let's try to do this, OK? Uh, suppose, uh, so you take uh, an initial radius, uh, and I will call it 2 just to, you know, uh, just or, or even 10 to make things simpler. So suppose uh, E is, let's epsilon close to a plane P in some ball 
and let me normalize so that it's a ball of size 10. Okay, very flat. And I want to say that in half a ball, or maybe in the unit ball, uh, I am actually a C1 surface, or at least all the beta numbers are small. That's the game, and it's essentially equivalent to what I said, so the only thing that I have to say before that is I have his origin, I take a radius so small that something happens. And two things could happen, and they are going to be equivalent. Let's say here, I just say it's close enough to a plane. I could have said also the density is close enough, and that would have been equivalent. Okay. Uh, R is less than omega is pi plus epsilon 1 for x in, let's say, E intersected, or let's even say the ball of center 0 and radius 5. I'm using this thing here. I'm saying the thing is close enough, so I draw a picture, but the, the picture will not tell you so much. I have this big ball. Uh, I draw the plane. E is close to the plane, so I don't need to draw it. Okay? And I'm saying whenever I take a ball of radius 4, okay, and I compute the measure in this thing, since the guy is close to the plane, uh, and if I arrange uh, this epsilon 1, so uh, in all, all I'm going to say, epsilon has to be taken so small that uh, with a given small epsilon 1, this works. Okay? And then I continue. So in other words, epsilon will be extremely small, this one a little less small, and so on. Okay? So anyway, I get this. So again, this is just a way of saying that the measure of a ball is less than the measure of a plane plus something. And the measure of a plane is always less than pi times the radius squared. Okay? That's what I'm saying here in condensed ways. Okay. So this is good because also at any point of E, okay, the density, we know it's always larger than pi. Uh -huh. Between 0 and R0, we know that we have almost constant density because the thing is increasing. It starts from pi. It goes just a tiny bit higher. Okay. Okay. Implies. Uh, essentially, it's finished, right? E is uh, epsilon 2 close to a plane in B of x r, any r between uh, 0 and r0, over 2. And this is the reason why I took 4 and I have still 2 left. OK? Uh, uh, yeah, not much happened. That was the point. OK? Uh, but still, there is something which is a little upsetting. I, I told you, well, let's do the case of a plane. It's going to be easier. Yeah, it's definitely easier. Uh, I'm using this information here, which is always true, that the lowest possible density is pi. And it, I'm lucky because I had exactly this estimate here. Okay. Uh, if I want to continue the proof, I need some additional topological information, which I will not do because I want to talk about the other part of the proof, uh, which is that... Uh, Suppose the set was looking like a plane, uh, like a Y. Okay, and again, let me try. Boy, hard to, to draw Y. Uh, okay, bad Y. Okay. Uh, on all the balls centered here, the thing looks like a Y because it's a blow up limit anyway, and uh, we don't worry about this. Uh, in balls centered here, I can do exactly the same argument as I was doing here because the density, I mean, the measure of this piece of plane is very close to pi times the radius, so I will be able to succeed. But, of course, if I happen to take an x, which is here, uh, I'm in slight trouble, okay? And there is a lemma which is needed to say that actually when I take a ball like this, 
I can find points of type y, uh, which means whose blow up limits are y's or whose density is three halves, okay, nearby. And then I can apply the same argument to them, saying, aha, the density was large, uh, the measure is not much larger, we can finish. Okay, so there is a topological lemma that says you can find points of type y. Okay, and I say topological lemma because the way you prove it is you say, okay, suppose there is no point of type y, then the thing is smooth. At a large scale, it looks like a y. So for instance, if I take a circle that crosses here, it's going to cross E three times by the regularity theorem. By continuity of a number of crossings, modulo two, you get a contradiction, okay? And it's a contradiction of topological nature. And it works very well in this case. Uh, if you were in higher dimensions, uh, you would be in trouble, okay? So that's supposed to be the end. Uh, here I'm saying you can fix this problem uh, because we're in low dimension and we only have three types of minimal cones. Cones of type T, but uh, the points of type T are isolated. It's the center. You don't care about it. It's very fine. The thing is fine. Points of type Y, and you have to find enough points of type Y to apply my argument below. And this is topology. And then points of type P are easier because you apply the argument right away. So typically in high dimensions, uh, if you want just this sort of result by Holder, there is, for instance, uh, I have an ex student whose name is Lu, who was able to prove things like uh, if your blow up limit is a plane or the, a Y, which is a product of a Y by some larger dimension, then you can prove Holder regularity. Okay? And then afterwards, there will be other types of cones. And uh, for the other types of cones, so for instance, if we take T times a product, we don't know how to prove the lemma that, that you would like, which is that you would have lots of T points near the line. Uh, you take T times a line, right? And you would like not only to know that there is a T point in the center, but also that there are points along the line. And this is typically the sort of thing we cannot do. So we're in trouble. So yeah, so the only things that I know is regularity theorems near cones that we control very well. And unfortunately, there is a list of cones that we control very well, which is two. OK? That's what's happening in our story. OK, so I'm supposed to say, so here, the uh, things are easier, OK? And I, I think it's worth mentioning it. We still get some information of the folder uh, equivalence uh, because we only want some uniform estimates and we don't want to show that something tends to zero. In order to prove a C1 estimate, you have to prove some decay. Okay. instead of just saying small, okay? And small you can prove by compactness. This is what I did essentially. Uh, decays means that you really have to show that this quantity gets smaller. Yesterday, the good decay quantity was tilt. We don't want to use tilt because with uh, sets like Y, we don't know how to define it or control it or any way. Tilt doesn't seem to work so far. Uh, maybe it will work one day, I don't know, but at this time, in the proof that I'm presenting, it's not tilt, okay? Because we cannot control it so well. And in this case, it's going to be density excess. Okay. The density of a cone uh, difference with a real density at radius r. And so we, what we want to show is that as soon as this thing is large for r, it decays when r tends to zero, so it, I should say it increases, with some speed which is proportional to it, uh, with a power of r, which I don't want to tell you. Okay? So this is the quantity that I decided I like. Okay? And, the, the, and the proof has two pieces. One which is prove that this thing goes down. 
And the second one is that once you know that this thing goes down, you have to say why it controls the geometry. And the second part I claim is easier, or at least it's more natural. The main thing is to try to prove that uh, f of r larger than 0 implies uh, f prime of r larger than some constant times f of r. And I think it's over r. Or R, uh, let's say this is uh, this is uh, like uh, one over R. Yeah. Okay. Normalize. Uh, usually, when I take R is equal to one, and I don't have to worry. Okay. Right. So this is the game. Uh, s uh, small indication about the game. Okay. Just to tell you where I mean why some things have a chance to work. Uh, if I just wanted to show that this was larger than zero, I would know how to do it. This is monotonicity. Let's imagine that my set is minimal, uh, so that I don't get confused. Uh, it's monotonicity. As if just if I compare with a cone, I will get exactly the information that I have. Okay. So in fact, here, if I want to prove an inequality like this, the only thing that I have to show is that I can get a competitor which is better than the cone by more or less this amount, f of r over r. So this is the sphere of radius r, OK? And improve significantly, which means win something like f of r, uh, in this case, times r2, right scaling. OK? So that's, that's the game. Okay. At the end, it's going to end up like this, except that, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you won't see it. But for instance, in Jean Taylor's theorem, there is a first preliminary paper where she proves epiparametric inequalities in these circumstances. And then there is a second one where she proves a thing. And I'm sort of following the same route, but in a different way. So, so do you okay. make a unit of anything? Hmm? Does, does this also give you the unit of anything? Uh, yeah, by, by definition, uh, let's say, this is one of the remarks that I forgot to say. As soon as you have a statement of Gene Taylor's theorem, you get uniqueness because the thing is a C1 version. OK. Uh, but of course, it's cheating because you get the uniqueness in a case where you know more. All right, it's not. Uh, exactly like in the Allard theorem, yes, you get uniqueness of a tangent cone, but yeah, uh, you, you're much happier with what you get than the uniqueness of a tangent cone. Okay. okay. Let me try to do drawings in the case of a T, okay? Uh, And there is a hidden, oh, okay, there is a hidden one out there, okay? I look at the intersection, so I will work with a fixed ball. Uh, almost every fixed ball like this will work. I want the Hostoff measure of dimension one on the, of a set intersected with a ball to be finite so that I can draw things more easily. I'm looking at the intersection of a sphere, and again, remember, let's, let's for instance look at one of those faces here. There is six of them. E is close to one of those uh, uh, faces here. And the initial information that I say is that when I go from both sides of a set of this face, uh, the set E separates these faces. If it did not, you would be able to draw a hole, pull out <coughs> things, and essentially make this face disappear. OK, so there is some topology. The set really has to separate points on both sides. OK, and in particular on the sphere, of a set has to separate these two triangular caps that you can imagine here from each other. So this means that there is a line, I mean a curve, gamma e i. So there will be six i's depend, uh, corresponding to the six faces. And I can pull out this guy contained in E intersected with dbr. Okay. And I do that for every face. And in fact, they even connect. So I have another face here, a third face here. Again, they connect or something like this. So I guess this bunch of curves, OK? And this will be, so this would be good for me because uh, I want to, yeah, I want to construct competitors. And OK, trust me, it's interesting to have these curves, OK? Uh, 
In fact, uh, yeah, let me save even uh, epsilon more time. Uh, so first you get these curves. And you know that the length of these curves by some Chebyshev argument is very close anyway to the measure of a set inside dB. So in fact, these curves are not so far from having the optimal length. They are not really far away from the geodesics. And to make things simpler here, uh, let's even assume that they are Lipschitz graphs with small constants. In effect, what happens is that you take this gamma i, you transform them to be Lipschitz graphs with small constants, you make a small error, and at the end, you fix all the errors. And I will tell you in a second what I mean by Lipschitz with small constants. Again, otherwise, what happens is that you construct Lipschitz guys, and then at the end, you do manipulation. So the good thing about Lipschitz uh, curve with small constants is that, for instance, so let's say I was supposed to compare with a cone. And what I will end up doing is comparing with a cone over the union of these six curves. Okay? And I'm not making a small error, a large error. It's almost the same, and I'll do it. With OK, so let's look at this face here. The, uh, uh, there are these two points at the end points of the curve. I put them in a flat plane because it's easier to understand. So now I have a plane, and in fact a sector. I have my curve here, which gets out of a plane. I have the two points here that are on the plane, and zero, which is also on the plane, which are the end points of the curve. And I have gamma i. Okay. So when I'm saying Lipschitz curve, now, OK, it's, it's really a Lipsch, I, I say it's a Lipschitz curve over that plane. OK, that was determined by the endpoints and the two things. OK, right. And there are two competitors. One is the one which essentially gives you that f is monotone, which is I take the cone over this curve and I compute its surface measure. Okay. And there is another one which is better. Uh, which is the, you take this thing here and you find a harmonic function whose graph is the thing you look for. Okay, so in other words, here I have an extension of a function here, which is the extension, which is linear homogeneous of degree one, which gives the cone. And I replace it by a harmonic function. And I know that up to small errors, harmonic functions will minimize surface better than cones. Okay. And so, I win something significant, okay? unless the curve here was already something that, that looks a lot like a geodesic. Okay? So if the curves don't look like geodesics, I win. I find a better competitor by doing harmonic. Okay? And I win about what I need. Otherwise, it means that I had a bunch of curves that look a lot like geodesics. Okay? Here comes the geometry. Uh, the geometry uh, says we have a bunch of geodesics. Maybe they're not doing exactly the right angles and so on and so forth. Okay? And you want to say that if it is not exactly, if they don't make exactly the right angles, then you can find a better competitor than this cone. Okay? So now you're looking at cones over geodesics. And uh, maybe they make slightly different angles than what's needed. And I'm saying whenever they make different angles than pi over 2 in this case, or whenever they're not the t like this, uh, then why don't I get? Oh, yes, it's coming. OK. Uh, whenever it, uh, you can improve on that. OK. And here comes the epiferometry, if you want. So it's, I think it's a, it's a simpler form of epiferometry. Uh, it boils down to saying I have a minimal cone. I try small perturbations of the minimal cones, but just by geodesics, okay? and, uh, and I want to say that this cone was really minimal in the sense that you, when I try to perturb and I get a total length which is longer, then I can do some uh, manipulation by hands where this thing is improved. And again, uh, then you do it cone by cone. This is the reason why in dimension three you can do it for all the cones and it's slightly painful but not bad. And for the cones you don't know, it's much harder to do this thing. Okay, so that's where epiferometry comes. It's, uh, in this argument, it's hidden somewhere. But, uh, okay. but 
okay, this is where it sort of comes. But it comes at the end, once you've been settling all these problems about curves, and it's essentially the story about curves is a way to say, we just need to worry about geodesics instead of curves, and that's making things life better. Okay, two or three pictures. I'm sorry I'm a little late, but then I have this excuse that uh, in principle, we're supposed to like pictures better than Ah, if I ever get to enter my machine. Good. Okay, so the goal of these pictures is to remind me also of many things that I didn't say and forgot, but at the same time, it's probably going to be too short. So this will be rather fast, I think. This is what I promised to you. These are the two cones that I was drawing so badly. Uh, and in particular, you see the sort of curves that I would, so the intersection with a sphere would be one curve like this, and then uh, two other ones here and two down there. Okay, so one would be here. I noticed, you know, I brought this thing all the way from Paris so that I would not have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. It's amusing, uh, when I took it this morning, uh, I had the impression this was a huge screen and I would never be able to reach. <laughs> Okay, so this is a proof that uh, you can see SOAP, I mean, you can see the Gene Taylor theorem on SOAP fields very easily. So this is clearly a T. This is a SOAP bubble, so it's an almost minimal set. And you can see T points here, here. And then there is a bubble inside, which means that indeed there is some curvature here, mean curvature is not zero. And you have a point of type T that you can clearly identify here, another one like this. Then uh, smaller bubbles are trapped. They are almost minimal with worse constants. And of course, they get more distorted. That's not too shocking. And when the size of a small soap bubble is too small, you cannot say more, uh, much more. Same story here. I hope you can see why there is a Gene Taylor theorem in this picture. Uh, again, the interesting point is here and here. And then there is a set of Y points that, you can, uh, that is hidden here. Of course, the singularities of type Y connect nicely with singularities of type T. This is to remind me uh, to tell you that, yes, currents are nice, but uh, when there is a problem with uh, orientation, sets are better. And when I'm saying this, I'm lying a little bit because there are ways to do unoriented currents. For instance, work modulo 2, but I think eventually you still always come up to uh, something complicated. This picture is to tell you that Many times on a minimal set, you can find a current, which is a size minimizing current, which is supported on that set. But you have some algebraic business to perform. So for instance, here, in order to put a size minimizing current here, which means that it wouldn't have no boundary inside, you have to put multiplicities on the faces so that this fits. And the simplest multiplicity is something like this here, right? Multiplicity four on, the, on that face. Uh, multiply three on this one and so on, one here, two here and two here. And, and then it works, then you, you, you kill all the boundaries, but uh, yeah. It's modulo something or not? Mm -hmm. Sorry? It's modulo? No, no, so this thing is as, if you put these multiplicities on this set, uh, you first get a size minimizing guy and the main thing is that it has boundary zero inside. Because uh, you know, along three faces, the sum of a multiplicity is just zero in the way that. Okay? But I'm saying this because, of course, uh, if you find a minimal set and want to build a current on it, it might be complicated uh, in general. Right? This is because uh, yeah, I didn't tell you about the proof of the first part of the Gintera theorem, which is what is the list of minimal cones. There are lots of things that look like minimal cones here. You don't see it, but the intersection with a sphere is a bunch of geodesics. Okay, so in other words, the union of face is over something here. So all the angles are right, which is a, a hint that it's, it looks like a minimal set, but it's not a minimal set because this one is better. Uh, similarly, this was one candidate. So this is all taken from Bracky's uh, homepage. This looks like a minimal cone, but it's not because this one is doing better. And I have a third one, uh, and this one is doing better. And when you continue with the list, it's even more obvious. But there is a list of about 10 that one has to check and destroy one after the other, and uh, you're left with. 
This is two pictures about what happens when you s draw uh, soap film in water. The second one is an amusing one because here there is no soap and there is some strange singularity here where the thing leaves. Uh, sorry, okay. I'll try to, yeah. I started late. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, then it's interesting to see how the soap film is allowed to leave the wire at this point. That's the point. So if it's a thick wire, we understand, oh, another example of this, again, taken from Brackett's side. Uh, so you take these three curves or little tubes that make a knot to each other. You dip in soap, you get lots of examples. And one of them is like this, where indeed, I mean, some of the things here are partially wet and partially, uh, sorry, uh, are partially empty here and are partially uh, covered here, which means that the soap leaves some of the curves from time to time. And again, uh, this is the way it happens on a thick tube. No problem about that, we understand. In fact, uh, Fang has a theorem holder and soon a theorem C1, I hope, that says that this is the worst behavior when a soap arrives on the surface. Um, you know, this is perfectly clear. The question is what happens when the diameter of this thing tends to zero? Okay. Uh, I, so there is a theorem that says that then the thing uh, tends to a minimal cone. This is still true on the, along the boundary. And there is no minimal cone uh, that looks like what you think, which is a plane plus a vertical plane. That's not a minimal cone, so it's not excluded. I don't know the list of minimal cones, so I cannot tell you one by one. But I think there is a most probable minimal cone uh, so this is the same picture with a smaller, and done by me, so it's, that's the reason why it's so beautiful, uh, where a thing gets thinner. And then uh, what seems to happen, and what Brachy says happens, is that this thing becomes more and more like a vertical plane. So the blow-up limit in this case, in fact, uh, if you have a wire, would be a vertical plane. Okay, and maybe I'll stop here. This is... Uh, this is another instance of what Camilo was trying to describe. Uh, you know, we'll get at the end a beautiful smooth guy, which is a vertical plane. But we know that bad things happen near this guy. And it's going to be harder to control. But I, you know, I claim maybe not impossible. Uh, this is the Xiangyu conjecture about minimal cones. So we claim that with this boundary here, the cone over the edges of a cube is probably minimal, but we don't know how to prove it. And this is just uh, references, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I cannot show the two pages at the same time. There is Amgren, which was very important uh, reference here. And yeah, and the other ones, uh, Lawler and uh, Morgan, it's because they have a first conjecture about what things look like near the boundary. But I think it has to be revisited and, and, and eventually proved, right? After it's revisited. Reifenberg, very important problem of offering and Taylor. Okay. So thanks. I'm sorry for yeah, abusing more, even more. Thank you.